I believe the devil wants to take over the church. I believe the devil wants to take over this church. One person at a time. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. Call your window, go back inside your house. Go back inside right now! I am inside. We have a real chance at this new world order. An order in which a credible United Nations tasers. can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it was a phrase that I often used myself, that we needed a new world order, and instead it looks like we got a lot of disorder. It's been a long time coming because of what we did on this day, at this defining moment, change has come to America. President Obama and British Prime Minister Gordon today calling for a new world order to tackle our global economic crisis. The affirmative task we have now is to actually create a new world order. Its task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. talk about the New World Order defined, as you have, as being Luciferian. Yes. Um, how do you know that? My investigations led me to look at the back of the American dollar, and I found these strange seals on the dollar here. They're Illuminati seals, which was a secret society set up in 1776 by a man called Adam Weishaupt. And on the back of the dollar here, you see the seal on the left-hand side, and there's an eye in the triangle. It's the eye of Horus in Egyptian mythology, now called the Eye of Lucifer, or Satan. The two words at the top, Annua Chapters, stand for announcing the birth of, and down the bottom, Novus Ordo Seclorum. And that great seal of the United States has on it, Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new order. And people should be asking the question, what is an Egyptian pyramid doing on the back of an American dollar? What link-up is there between America and Egypt? The answer is none at all except in the field of the occult. And thus we see we're dealing with a Luciferian plan. People need to recognize the God of Freemasonry will lead the world into this peculiar and particular purpose for which America was set up, which is to lead the whole world system into a one-world government, a one-world religion, a one-world law system, and a one-world money system that the Bible calls the mark of the beast. And basically what we know for a fact that there is going to be a changeover from the old order to a new order, a rule by Satan himself. That's what that symbol refers to and that's what the new world order refers to. In the King James, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Notice how the New English Bible renders this verse. It says, The old order is gone, and a new order has begun. They're using the same language. The King James says, Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation, talking about Christ's coming, but notice the NIV calls it until the time of the new order. They're preparing people. Now I want you to notice this. In Isaiah 28, 16, in the King James, the Bible says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. This is referring to Jesus, right? And I want you to notice that in the King James, they're telling you that Jesus is the cornerstone of the foundation. Now where's the foundation in relation to a building? On the top or the bottom? It's on the bottom, isn't it? Okay? So when they say that Jesus is the cornerstone of the foundation, that's down here, right? 
Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, this is the King James, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Again, on the foundation. Notice that the NIV calls him the capstone. They're saying that that symbol that you see represents Christ. It doesn't. It represents who? Antichrist. I pray that you will stay, however, my friends, with this great book, The Word of God. This truly is what we need to turn to. The time is short. A great falling away from the truth. It's happening. It's right here now. My name is Stephen Anderson, pastor of Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. Our church is King James only. A lot of people don't understand why. But the purpose of this film is to show the dramatic difference between the King James Bible and all the other versions. My name is Roger Jimenez. I'm the pastor of Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento, California. And the reason I'm excited to be a part of this film is because the Word of God is under attack today. And we need to take a stand for the Bible so that we can engage Him in spiritual warfare. My name is Dennis McCain. I'm the pastor at Northside Baptist Church in Modesto, California. I've been pastoring here for 16 years and been in the ministry as a missionary church planter for almost 40 years. Now there's an agenda today and it's a satanic agenda to change the Bible. A lot of people just think, well, the King James Bible is a great translation. It's, it's very poetic and these other versions are inferior. Maybe they're not as well translated. But I'm here to tell you it goes much deeper than that. These new versions are actually Satan's attempt at corrupting the Word of God. I'm going to show you that these changes are not just accidental. They're not just minor, inconsequential changes. I mean, these changes are strategic changes. They are calculated to attack specific doctrines that the Bible teaches. The Bible tells in Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are people who have many millions and even billions of dollars who have an agenda to put out corrupted Bibles and then promote them through advertising, promote them through retail stores that will put them front and center and that will show people this is the Bible you ought to be reading. Get rid of the King James Bible. Get the newer, better, improved version. Now, I did some research on what the most popular versions are today. This is the most current list. I checked this with a bunch of different sources and they all came up with the same five Bibles. The number one Bible today is not the King James Bible. It's the New International Version, the NIV. Number two is the King James Bible. Number three, the New Living Translation. Number four, the New King James. And number five, the English Standard Version or the ESV. Different lists I looked at had those in a slightly different order, but they all had those five. Most people don't realize that there are hundreds of translations, and obviously we don't have the time to go through each and every one of them. It would make a lot more sense to just focus on the four corruptions that are the most popular. The NIV is missing 16 entire verses from the New Testament. I mean, just right out of the gate, before we talk about all the thousands of changes, just 16 verses are completely missing. Matthew 17, 21, gone. Matthew 18, 11, gone. Acts 8, 37, that verse is gone from the NIV, gone from the ESV, gone from the New Living Translation, completely gone. Acts 8, 36, King James Bible. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me be baptized? And Philip, that's the soul winner, said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So the eunuch, that's the sinner, says, What's hindering me? What's stopping me from getting baptized? Philip, the soul winner, says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he, the eunuch, answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What just happened to the eunuch? He got saved. Why? If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He believed in his heart, he confessed with his mouth, he got saved. So what they do? Verse 38, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So verse 36, what's stopping me from getting baptized? Verse 37, as long as you believe you can get baptized, he confessed with his mouth, believes in his heart. Verse 38, they baptized him. Amen. 
What does the New International Version say? As they travel along the road, they came to water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now, did you just catch what happened? What was missing? I don't know if you noticed. The entire verse 37 was missing. So according to the New International Version, they're going down the road. He says, What's stopping me from getting baptized? According to the NIV, nothing. Let's just baptize you. What's missing? Believe on Jesus Christ. What's missing? The gospel. What's missing? Why are these Bibles attacking Jesus Christ? Doesn't make any sense to me. But it would make sense if you realize that Satan's behind them. But not only have they removed 16 entire verses from the NIV, they also put notes on 27 other verses saying, these verses were probably not in the original. Again, causing you to doubt God's word. Verses like Mark 16, 15. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verses like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They haven't removed these verses, but they've put a note next to it that renders it in the reader's mind null and void, saying, well, this probably wasn't in the original anyway. This doesn't really have any authority anyway. We believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Amen. This is something that these modern versions constantly change and attack. Let me give you some examples. 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's where we get the word Trinity, three in one. These three are one. The NIV, on the other hand, just says, for there are three that testify. Doesn't mention the Father, doesn't mention the Word, doesn't mention the Holy Ghost, and does not mention that the three are one. Look what they've done with 1 Timothy 3.16. The Bible reads, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Watch this. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It was God that was believed on in the world. It was God that was received up into glory. It was God who was made flesh and dwelt among us. And the Bible is crystal clear in 1 Timothy 3.16 that Jesus Christ is God. In 1 Timothy 3.16, it's an important passage because I would often read the footnotes in the New American Standard that I had in seminary and later on in the NIV and other passages. And they would say in the footnotes or they would say in their commentaries or those teaching from the NIV or the New American Standard, they'd say that there isn't any difference in theology. It doesn't affect any doctrinal perspectives. But obviously there's a difference between Haas and Theos. If you take as he who was Haas instead of Theos, instead of it being God, it obviously weakens the text because right. you have to assume that Christ is God and right. made manifest. But in Theos, there's no wondering about what the text says. It's right. God who was manifest in the flesh and that's got to be the person of Christ. And that certainly influences people's thinking on the deity of the Lord Jesus. Right. Another great proof of the fact that Jesus Christ is God is Hebrews 1.8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So what is the Bible calling the Son there? It's calling him God. It says, Unto the Son, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Listen to the NIV. But about the Son, he says. Recently, I was talking to a Jehovah's Witness in the train station. I went to pick my wife up. Mm -hmm. And the Jehovah's Witness was starting to read to me out of a devotional book she had, but I saw her New World Translation. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, is the New World Translation from the Greek? She said, it's from the Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament. Mm -hmm. I said, is it accurate? She said, of course. I said, do you, have you had Greek? She said, no. I said, what would you do if Jehovah himself spoke to Jesus and called him God? Mm -hmm. That never happened. So I quoted for Hebrews 1.8. Under the sun, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Uh -huh. She became so excited, so upset. She took her bags and rolled out the door, and I followed her out the door talking to her. <laughs> but when I read it from the New World Translation later, it completely has been changed. Mm. Whereas in the King James, you can't misunderstand it. But not only that, but they attack Christ's virgin birth. Go to Luke chapter 2.33. The Bible says, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. The NIV, on the other hand, and the ESV, and the New Living Translation say, the child's father and mother 
marveled at what was said about him. So right there we see that the NIV and these other modern versions are calling Joseph the father of Jesus Christ, something that the King James Bible is careful to never do. Was Joseph the father of Jesus Christ? No, he was not. He was the stepfather of Jesus Christ, I'll give you that, but he was not the father of Jesus Christ. In fact, later in this same chapter, Mary refers to Joseph as Jesus' father, and he corrects her immediately. It says, when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So didn't she just refer to Joseph as Jesus' father? Watch how he immediately corrects her. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? He's saying, look, I'm about my father's business when I'm preaching the word of God because Joseph is not my father. God the father is my father. People who believe the NIV, they're so blinded. I've actually had them show me this and say, See, this is the Bible calling Joseph Jesus' father. No, that's Mary calling Joseph Jesus' father. And she's immediately rebuked and somebody needs to rebuke the NIV. Somebody needs to correct the New Living Translation. Somebody needs to rebuke the ESV and say, wait a minute, you're wrong. That is not Jesus' father. Jesus' father is God the Father. You say, well, they're just a little easier to understand. Well, the changes don't really affect doctrine. These are some pretty important doctrines, aren't they? The deity of Christ, the virgin birth. Not only that, they attack his eternal pre-existence. See, Jesus Christ did not come into being in Bethlehem's manger. Jesus Christ did not come into being in the womb of Mary, but rather Jesus Christ has always existed and always will exist. He is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the ending, and that's crucial to his deity. If he's a created being, he can't be God. The Bible says in Micah 5 2, but thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, watch this, from everlasting. So here in Micah 5, 2, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is from everlasting. Those are two very powerful words because they speak to the eternal preexistence of Jesus Christ. He had no beginning. He is not a created being. He was God in the flesh. He was in the beginning with God, and he was God. Now, everlasting means it goes on forever, it lasts forever. So from everlasting would be something that comes from the eternal past or something that, that comes from the infinite past, something that has always existed. Listen to the NIV. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, Watch this, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now, what's an origin? That's when something starts to exist, isn't it? When something originates, that's when it starts to exist. Look, did Jesus start to exist at some point? No, he's from everlasting in the King James Bible. But according to the NIV, he had an origin. If Jesus Christ had an origin, then he's not God because God was and is and is to come. God has always existed. God is not a created being. But this is where the NIV really just delivers the coup de gras. Isaiah 14, 12 says this, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Only one place in the entire Bible do you find the word Lucifer, once. Here we actually put a name on Satan, calling him Lucifer. And if we were to walk down the street and just ask people, who is Lucifer? What is Lucifer? They'd all say, it's Satan. It's the devil. Do you know who Lucifer is? An angel that was cast down from heaven, Satan. Satan. That's Satan. That's the devil. The devil. He's Satan. 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 The devil. The devil. The devil. <laughs> all right. Who's Lucifer? The devil. All right. It's an easy question, I know. That's perfect. Satan, yeah. The only way you and I know that Satan's name is Lucifer is because of Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now I want you to notice, it gives us his name and it gives us his title. O Lucifer, son of the morning. So what's the title of, Lu of Lucifer? Son of the morning, right? Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. The King James Version says this. 
I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am, this is Jesus speaking, I am the root and the offspring of David, this is Jesus speaking, and the bright and morning star. Do you see that? What did Jesus call himself? The morning star. That's his title. So both the King James and the NIV in Revelation 22, 16 state that Jesus Christ is the morning star. What does the NIV call Lucifer falling down from heaven? How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. So instead of Lucifer being cast out of heaven in Isaiah 14, 12, in the NIV, you have Jesus being cast out of heaven. Now look, the Bible has told us that Lucifer or Satan was cast out of heaven for wanting to be like the Most High, wanting to be like God. Look, the NIV, after attacking Christ's deity, after attacking his pre-existence, after attacking the fact that he was born of a virgin, that he had no beginning, that he had no ending, that he was God in the flesh, it's now accusing him of wanting to be like the Most High. He is the Most High. According to your NIV, Jesus fell from heaven and not Lucifer. The people who are behind these versions are of Satan. Satan wanted to corrupt the word in the Garden of Eden, and we are not ignorant of his devices. See, the word of God has great power. The Bible reads in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The devil knows that if he can disarm us as Christians, he can defeat us. The goal is and always has been to disarm us of our weapon. Look at history. When evil men want to conquer a group of people, you know what precedes the conquering? They disarm those people of their weapons. See, the government tries to tell you, we want to remove your weapons because we're going to protect you. You, you know, If someone wants to take your weapon away, they're not trying to protect you. They're trying to make sure that when they come after you, you can't fight back. In 1929, the Soviet Union established gun control. Between 1929 and 1953, 20 million political dissidents were killed. In 1935, Germany established gun control, began to disarm its people. Between 1933 and 1945, 13 million Jews and others were killed. In 1935, China established gun control and began to disarm its people. Between 1948 and 1952, 20 million political dissidents in China were killed. In 1970, Uganda established gun control, began to disarm its people. Between 1971 and 1979, catch this, 300,000 Christians were killed. In 1956, Cambodia established gun control and began to disarm its people. Between 1975 and 1977, one million Cambodians were killed. You gotta understand this. The enemy is constantly trying to take your weapon away, not to defend you, but so that you cannot defend yourself. Evil dictators have always disarmed the population to make them defenseless, to make them slaves. Governments know that if they can disarm the people, they'll be defenseless against their tyranny. Say, why is there an attack under the Word of God today? Of course there is, because if Satan can disarm you from the one thing you've got to hurt him, from the one thing you've got to engage him in battle, if he can disarm you, then it's easy pickings. The devil would love nothing more than to take the two-edged sword of the King James Bible out of our hand and replace it with a butter knife called the NIV. Replace it with a butter knife called the ESV. Replace it with a butter knife called the New King James. He doesn't want us to be armed. He doesn't want us to be able to do battle with the rulers of the darkness of this world. Second Thessalonians 2 reads in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the Bible tells us that before the Antichrist can come, before the one world government can come, before the new world order can come, there has to come a falling away first. What is falling away? Apostasy. And I believe that these modern Bible versions are key to the devil's plan for a one world religion, a one world government, a new world order. The Bible tells us that before Christ's second coming, there will be a great falling away, the apostasia. 
the great falling away before Christ's second coming will be as a result of these false, lying, modern Bible versions that are twisting and changing God's word and changing the doctrines of Christ. I mean, they're putting mistakes in our Bible and then people are doubting the Bible. They're doubting God. They're believing in evolution. They're believing in all this thing. All it's doing, it's promoting a one world government. Why? Because it's promoting a falling away. And what's interesting is that people often, when they refer to the one world government or the one world religion that's coming, they often refer to it as the new world order, right? Who's heard that term before, the new world order? It is a big idea, a new world order. They would rush into the home in an armored line, guns at the ready. It is a new world order. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Are you optimistic a global system can happen, from it, what it, we've heard so far. It, it, it could happen, and in fact it's in the works. The people that are behind this treaty want that world yeah. government, and in their minds this is a step toward it. You mean controlling ammo, controlling the amount that's available, eventually controlling the market? Eventually controlling all of us. Here's what's interesting. Did you know that the NIV uses the term new order about the coming of Christ? In the King James Bible, Hebrews 9.10 says, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now that's talking about something that already happened in the past, right? The time of reformation is a reference to the coming of Jesus Christ. Now you gotta understand that. That is a reference to the first coming of Jesus Christ. We no longer do the meats, the drinks, the divers washings, the carnal ordinances. We no longer do any of that. Why? Because of the time of reformation came. The Lord Jesus Christ came. Listen to the NIV, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. And then if you read verse 11 in the NIV, it makes it sound as if that's something that's still coming in the future. The new order was not just the first coming of Christ, but that the second coming of Christ is what's referred to by the new order. The good news translation comes right out and says it. These are all outward rules which apply only until the time when God will establish the new order. The New English Translation also calls it the New Order. The Common English Bible also calls it the New Order. The best-selling Bible in America today calls the coming of Christ the New Order. Guess what? There is coming an Antichrist, and when he comes, it will be the time of the New Order. But that's not what Hebrews is talking about. There's a lot in these new Bibles that tamper with end times Bible prophecy in order to prepare people to accept the Antichrist, in order to prepare people to be sucked into this new world order, in order to prepare people to be deceived by this global government, one world religion, one world system of the Antichrist, and to receive the mark of the beast. So Pastor Jimenez, you're going on these conspiracies. You believe in the new world order? You, you think it's crazy to think that there are bankers and people out there trying to bring in a, a one world government? The, I don't know if you've ever read the book of Revelation, but the Bible tells us that the Antichrist is going to bring in a one world government. The Bible tells us that the Antichrist is going to bring a one world religion. I don't think it's that far fetched that people are saying, oh, the bankers are bringing in a new world order with a one world government, with a whatnot. Now, they may think, you know, these conspiracy theories guys, they may think, oh, it's just the bankers, it's just this. But we know in the Bible that the Antichrist is bringing in that same thing. That's what the Bible says. From the Garden of Eden, there's been an attack on the Word of God. Even before the Bible was completely written down, there was an attack on the Word of God. And you think it's different today? It's not. You gotta understand this. Today, the Word of God is under attack. The modern Bible versions are clearly different than the King James Bible. And you've got to ask yourself this question, why? In order to understand the difference, you need to understand the history of the English Bible. Turns out there's a Bible museum right here in Phoenix that has one of the largest collections of rare English Bibles in the world. And the museum director, Joel Lamp, is going to let us actually look into these rare first editions of the Bibles leading up to the King James and the King James itself. He's going to explain to us the history of our King James Bible. He's going to take us all the way from Erasmus Greek New Testament, the original Texas Receptus, and he's going to take us through the history of all these English Bibles all the way up to the King James Version. So let's start with Erasmus. What you see here on the table, Pastor, is, in a nutshell, the history of the King James Bible. Now remember, this King James Bible was printed in 1611, and there's a common misconception out there that it was the first English. Well, it wasn't. There were numerous other English examples before right. 1611. Uh -huh. And what you see here starts with the original Greek 
as you just said, Texas Recept is done by Erasmus of Rotterdam. This literally changed everything from what we know today in church history as well as in just secular history. It's called the 1516 Erasmus of Rotterdam's Greek, Latin, New Testament. Well, let's just call Erasmus what he is, the okay. smartest man that ever lived, okay? Non deity factor. Okay, Jesus, of course, is the <laughs> smartest man that ever lived, but Solomon's up there as well. But even today, we consider Erasmus the smartest, whether it's in sciences, theology, philosophy. He was just that smart. And this is the original Texas the Receptus original, right here. The original Texas Receptus. Wow. Please take a look at it. Generally considered the most important book that was ever printed. And this is the book that launches the Reformation. Even as an atheist, you acknowledge this is the most important book ever printed. The Renaissance is launched from this. The truth comes from this book. And so we see just how imperative this book is, but what it also did was cause an enormity of problems. And what do I mean by that? Well, the money stopped flowing to Rome. There's a building under construction. There's a very famous interior designer down there that was hired to decorate it. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the Vatican, Michelangelo, the Sistine Chapel. That money stopped flowing. The church started putting bounties on people's heads saying, you can't teach this. This isn't what we consider accurate, even though Erasmus said, we kind of got a problem here. It does say, metanoia, not pay a fine. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to address this theological issue, but the Protestant movement was birthed from this book. And what does the Protestant movement actually mean? To protest. In this edition that you're showing me, Erasmus has put the original Greek mm -hmm. next to the church's Latin. That's correct and it makes it very easy to see the contradiction between the two. Of course. Is that right? That's why okay. it's, that's Just why making it, sure I understand. That's why it changed everything. Because it showed what we were doing wrong, showed what it should be. Right. But he didn't translate it to show what it should be until later. Okay. Okay, that wouldn't be until right. 1519. So th these are two contradictory things side by side. And all he's doing is just showing the evidence. The church's Latin corrupted version. Uh -huh and then the original Greek, Texas Receptus. Right. He just put it side by side and just basically let the reader be the judge. But this is the bullet that basically effectively killed the church. Right. What you see here is what we know today is the first edition Coverdale Bible. What really it is, though, is the work of William Tyndale. Now, as we know, Tyndale is the inventor of the English we speak today. He's also the inventor of our very first English Bible translated from the original languages. Tyndale in England wanted to do the same thing Luther was doing in Germany. Mm -hmm. And he went underground, and with the aid of Luther's library, books like this here, and later editions of Erasmus's work, Tyndale would produce the very first New Testament. It becomes the most hunted book in the history of England. And so the king wants this thing burned. So England was still totally under the control of the Catholic Church at the time that Tyndale is producing his New Testament 1526. And it is a book that's basically an assault mm -hmm. on the established or Catholic Church of London right. at that time. This became a monumental achievement because Tyndale, in the last years of his life, spent most of his time translating from the Hebrew and the Greek to produce this book. The rest of the Old Testament, some of it, they weren't able to get done from the original Hebrew by the time this book came out. Well, no, because Tyndale was arrested in 1534. Right. He's held under house arrest for 500 days. Okay. And then on the morning of October 6, 1536, he's taken out and burned. But in that incarceration period, Miles Coverdale mm -hmm. finished that which Tyndale had started. Gotcha. Now, what I love more than anything that we have in this room is this text here. This is the 1537, what we call the Matthews Bible. Now, what is this? It's nothing more than a completed this. Right. Now, remember when Tyndale dies, his last words, as you spoke so eloquently earlier, were, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Now, what happened in that prayer? Tyndale could have said a million things. Why waste your last breath saying, Lord, open the eyes of King of England? Tyndale knew that no matter how crazy Henry VIII was, that if he could get Henry VIII to break with the established Church of Rome, England would be won and protected. It's one thing to have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's another thing to have a personal relationship with Jesus with somebody wanting to wake up and kill you every morning. That was, mm -hmm. that was their mission. But finally, Henry VIII permitted the Bible to go free based on one thing, a divorce. These two texts obviously change England. 
You, you could truly have a personal relationship with Jesus from these two books. Mm -hmm. You had that mediator of the You had to have someone. Instead of just Jesus Christ being the mediator. Is what we call today the confession booth. Right. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been two weeks since my last confession. So this defeated the confessional booth. It got rid of it completely. Mm -hmm. There was no need anymore. You didn't have to have a man tell you what your penalty was for this crime that you committed against mm -hmm. God. Then what we have today is called the Great Bible, or the Bible that was actually authorized and permitted by Henry VIII, King of England. That will become fun and to remember a couple of things. A later edition of Erasmus's work was done by a guy named Beza. And another work that we're most familiar with, though, is this one here done by Stephanus. Mm -hmm. Now, Stephanus is important because he gives us the Greek that are Geneva Bible, or the Bible done by the reformers of John Calvin, William Whittingham, those guys, they will use this Greek text to translate what their English Bible is known as today is the Geneva Bible. Now it's famous because it's the first one with verses. Okay, and that's why the Geneva Bible is so you know, familiar to many of us. It's like, where did John 3.16 come from? Well, it came from they These divided guys, it into, into chapters verses and verses. verses. The gotcha. chapters were already there, chapters were already there. but the verses, the verses are. Gotcha. After Henry VIII, his son takes the throne, and we know him today as Edward VI. He died very young. He was only on the throne for four or five years. But in that time, he permitted the scriptures to go free as well. But he too had no spouse and no kids, and so when he doesn't have an heir, who ends up taking the throne? His sister, who we know today as Bloody Mary. And we don't call her that because she liked vodka, tomato juice with a splash of Tabasco. <laughs> we call her Bloody Mary because she was responsible for literally over 7,000 of her own people's death. Wow. And here's a perfect example. Here's a family pastor in Bloody Mary's reign. Here's mm -hmm. five mothers and five fathers all being burned at the stake. And for what reason? They taught their children the Lord's Prayer in English. Wow. And she had them burned at the stake. So in her zeal for the Catholic Church, she's, she's killing these people. The parents were teaching their kids. Okay, and they only wanted the church, church to, teach to teach them. their kids. We weren't qualified, Pastor, to teach our children. So basically, they're being burned at the stake for homeschooling. That's basically what it <laughs> came down to. About it. No, it's in, in yeah. a sense, it was. They wanted complete rule. Wow. Well, during that uprising, men of courage decided that we're going to rebel. Mm -hmm. And what were their names? John Knox, John Fox, William Whittingham. They fled England, and they go to work on a brand new text. And what do we call that text today? We call that the Geneva Bible. Well, it says right on there, it says someone has written here, family Bible. That's right. That's what it truly was, the very first family Bible. Right. What we know today is the Textus Receptus it will go to produce what we know as the very first homeschool Bible, the Geneva Bible. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this is the book that sails over on the Mayflower. Gotcha. That's the Bible that settles Jamestown. Mm -hmm. After Bloody Mary's terror, she had a sister. We, of course, we know her name as Queen Elizabeth. To win the hearts of the people, she gave us the Bishop's Bible. This was done by bishops, mm -hmm. done by pastors. But they're building upon the work of... The Geneva Bible. They, they just wanted something that was a little bit more authoritative. Right. This comes from people you can experts. trust. Experts. Hebrew, Greek experts, but truthfully, right. it never settles with the people. It was a glorious work. She was Somehow on, it just didn't catch on. It just never caught Maybe on. Maybe God just knew that something was better was coming down the pike. Yeah. And then, of course, she didn't have a spouse, no kids, so who would take the throne? Her cousin from Scotland, of course, we know him as King James. And that big, tall Bible that you see down there closest to you, that's the first edition of the King James Bible. And then a year later, he allowed the folks to buy one in a bookstore. And you're holding the very first King James New Testament. Wow. Now, then when we get to 1603, we have King James becoming king. King James VI of Scotland. He became the king... And it was said unto him that a new translation should be brought forth of the scriptures. And the reason why is that you got a lot of people using the Geneva Bible, but then they'd go to church and it's the Bishop's Bible. So there were two main versions and both of them had issues. The Geneva Bible had some issues. The Bishop's Bible had some issues. And so they said, let's just take the time to do it right. They got the best scholars in the land together. And they said, we're not trying to replace a bad version. 
we're going from good to better to best here. I mean, these are good translations. The Geneva Bible is good. The Bishop Bible is good. We're just going to perfect it and get it just dialed in. So from 1604 to 1610, the KJV was translated by 54 of the greatest scholars that existed at that time. Just to give you one example, one guy, Lancelot Andrews, was an expert in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Chaldean, Syriac, Arabic, and he also spoke 15 modern languages. That's one guy out of the 54 people that translated the King James Bible over the course of seven years. So there were those who were Arabic scholars, there were those who were Greek and Hebrew scholars, there were Aramaic scholars. Uh, they were men of great intellect, mm -hmm. all of them. Yeah. And their knowledge of the scripture was varied. They may have held some different beliefs or different areas of theology might be slightly different from one of the other translators. Mm -hmm. What they did was they divided themselves up into six groups. These six men translated these six books of the Bible and so forth. Mm -hmm. And when they did this, then they compared them all together. Mm -hmm. And each of the six groups did this. And then they chose one leader out of each group to evaluate all six groups. And they, so what happened was every passage of scripture was evaluated 15 times. Wow. And in the end of it all, all of them came into agreement mm -hmm. with what was translated based upon the correct verbal dynamic that they used. That is for what it says, that's what it means. Even if it was in slight contradiction to what they might think. The king in 1603 said, okay, I'm going to organize a committee. And no matter how long it takes, you're going to go to work using two rules. Old Testament must be translated from the Hebrew. New Testament must be translated from the Greek. And I am going to give you all the resources humanly possible to make this happen. So the best Hebrew of that day, the best scholarly Greek of that day. And in 1603, 53 guys were hired. They go off and for seven years they work on what we know today is the most important book in the history of man the first edition, first issue, first printing of the King James text. And it took them seven years. And they did a phenomenal job. And the King James that you and I read today, of course, comes from that 1769 right. revision. But this was the anchor of the text. And this is the product of it. And in 1612, he gives us what we know today as the very first handheld King James New Testament. And if this you can, is what caught on. That's what caught on. The handheld King New King says, Testament. if you can afford it, you can own it. Every bookstore in London sold it, and it would take off. And then it would become, and always has been, the number one selling book in the history of man. No book has ever outsold this text, or ever will. When we look at the Bible versions that led up to the King James, Tyndale, Matthew, Coverdale, Great Bible, Bishop's Bible, Geneva Bible, they all line up with the King James. They all basically say the same thing as the King James. The King James Bible is the culmination of the Bibles that preceded it. So if the King James Bible is consistent with all the other English Bibles that led up to it, why are these modern Bibles so different? Dr. James White is a guy who has debated against people that are King James only. He's written a book against those that are King James only. He's considered to be the expert of why King James onlyism is wrong. So we're going to go talk to him and, and figure out what his arguments are. James, we have guests. All right, how you doing? Dr. James White, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Good to be with you. Can you just give me Codex Sinaiticus in a nutshell and Codex B in a nutshell? Both uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are the, the primary objects of the vitriol of the King James Only movement because of the fact that they were so central in the development of a New Testament text other than the Textus Receptus. Two men by the names of Westcott and Hort put together a critical text mainly based on two manuscripts known as Sinaiticus or Codex Aleph and Vaticanus or Codex B. And these two manuscripts were thought by Westcott and Hort to be older and therefore more reliable than the other Greek texts that had been used in the Textus Receptus. The modern Bibles are supposedly the result of modern archaeology and modern scholarship and modern discovery. I mean, even the people who promote these modern Bibles will tell you, well, the modern publishers just have more resources available to them today. They just have manuscripts that just weren't available to the King James translators. That's why the modern Bibles are better, they'll say. 
And the reason they say that is because the manuscripts that the modern Bibles are translated from, the NIV, etc., are newer discoveries, meaning that they were buried for centuries. Now, let me ask you something. Do you believe that the true Bible was buried for centuries? I mean, do you really think that God would allow his people to be using the wrong Bible for hundreds and hundreds of years, and then all of a sudden in the 1800s, we're going to find the right manuscripts? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, God promised to preserve his word to all generations, but they're basically believing that God's word in its true form was buried somewhere. And that for all these centuries, everybody is reading and preaching and believing something that's wrong. And then thank God for the archaeology of the 1800s to dig up these new manuscripts, the true word of God that's been buried for all this. Look, if God took so much time and effort to bring us the word of God through all the prophets and holy men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost over the course of hundreds, yea, thousands of years, and then he just lets it get buried. No, these ones that have been dug up of late, these newer, better manuscripts are fraudulent. They have names like Codex Vaticanus. Now, hmm, what does that call to mind? Codex Vaticanus because it was found in the Vatican or it's Vatican related, to me makes it immediately suspect. Right. There are more than 5,200 Greek fragments and portions of the New Testament that are available for study. Wow. And 45 of those are the predominant texts that are used mm -hmm. by uh, translators for any outside the King James Bible. Okay. That's 1% of the manuscripts available. Or the King James Bible uses 99.06% of those 5,255 texts oh, wow. to translate from. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's partly called the majority text. Right. You have to also note, and I don't think this is mentioned that often, in the Gospels themselves, between Sinai Atticus mm -hmm. and also the Vaticanus, there are over 3,000 differences. Mm -hmm. So how do we know which one is the correct difference or the correct passage that should be used unless it's validated by the other 43 sources that right. they use. But if I have two manuscripts, A and B, mm -hmm. that are in conflict just in the Gospels in 3,000 places, how do I know which one is reliable? Right. So I'd rather trust in the predominance of manuscripts that gave us the Textus Receptus. Mm -hmm. If we find something that's been buried and it says something different than the, what's been received, the received text, the Textus Receptus, you know, the, the, the Bible that people have used for centuries, then that must be fraudulent. It must not be the Word of God if God didn't preserve it. They're basically rejecting thousands of Bibles in all different languages that are all saying the same thing. Instead, they're going to go with Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, just because they're supposedly older. Okay, but just because they're older doesn't mean that they're right. It doesn't mean that they're not fraudulent. Look, Paul told us in 2 Corinthians 2 that people were corrupting the Word of God even in his day. In 2 Thessalonians, they were already writing a false scripture pretending to be from the Apostle Paul. In Revelation 22, God was already warning people who would try to take away from or add to God's Word. So that's already been taking place. So just because you got a manuscript that's from 200 years after Christ, oh, there's no way it could be tampered with, right? Of course it could. And there are many, the Bible tells us, that corrupt the Word of God. Not a few, but many. These two manuscripts do not stand alone. Right. And today, the Nessial in 28th edition, UBS 4th uh, corrected, there are a number of places where not only does Sinaiticus disagree with Vaticanus, mm -hmm. though they frequently are together. Right. They don't stand alone in light of the papyri. Imbalanced prejudice on the part of Westcott and Hort for all of them be. But they were working before the papyri too. Anything right. before the papyri is today primarily irrelevant. It's become outdated with, because of newer discoveries of manuscripts. The discovery of the papyri, which, which of course came from, from Egypt in various sundry places. Alexandria is a city in Egypt. Egypt is a nation in the Bible that's always associated with that which is ungodly or sinful or wrong. For example, in Revelation 11, verse 8, the Bible reads, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, 
where also our Lord was crucified. So when God wants to use a place in the Bible to represent wickedness, to represent that which is ungodly and satanic, he uses Egypt to represent that. Egypt in the Bible is a symbol of wickedness, of ungodliness. The readings of those early manuscripts, P66, P75, P72, have verified and, and demonstrated that the textual tradition found in Sinaiticus and Vaticanus was not unique to them. This was, I mean, there's theories running around now that these were Roman Catholic forgeries and all the rest of this kind of silliness like that. You might not think that the NIV is a Catholic Bible and they'll tell, oh, it's evangelical, it's for Baptists. But you know what? I'm going to show you all the Catholic doctrines that it props up because it's from these Catholic manuscripts. Acts 837 has been removed from the modern Bible versions because it condemns infant baptism. This is why we don't do infant baptism. You know why? Because according to the Bible, what's stopping me from getting baptized? You got to believe and then be baptized. An infant can't believe. It. An infant's not even condemned. Infant dies, they go to heaven. But a Catholic could read that and say, well, infant baptism, go ahead. What's stopping you from getting baptized? Nothing. Let's just baptize him. No, something is stopping you from getting baptized. It's believing. It's just missing in your Bible. The Catholics teach a doctrine that Mary was still a virgin all the way throughout her life. Now, we know that, of course, Mary was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus Christ. But the Bible is clear that after that, she had other children. In fact, it lists four of Jesus' half-brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. He gives the names of the brothers, and then it says, his sisters, are they not all with us? So Jesus had at least seven half-siblings, maybe even more. Now, here's a great proof of that in Matthew 1.25. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So it doesn't say that he never knew her. It just says that he knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son. It says in verse 25 in the NIV, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. What's missing? Firstborn. If Jesus is the firstborn son of Mary, that tells me there's a secondborn. But the NIV removes that so you can say, well, you know, that was the only son that she had. Another doctrine of the Catholic Church that is supported by the NIV is the doctrine of beating yourself. And yes, you've heard me correctly, self-flagellation or beating yourself. Now, your Catholic friends that you know in the United States probably do not beat themselves. But throughout history, the Roman Catholic Church has taught and encouraged the practice of beating yourself, okay? In fact, when Henry VIII made Catholicism illegal in England and kicked the Roman Catholic Church out of England, he also at the same time passed a law against beating yourself. And even today in the Philippines, the devout Catholics will beat themselves today in 2013. In the Philippines, they crucify themselves, they beat themselves, they crawl on their knees, until they're bleeding. I mean, they do these type of acts to themselves. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The NIV says, I beat my body. And, and most of the modern versions say something along the lines of, I beat my body subdue. and make it my slave. Yeah. No, no, they don't say subdue. They say, no, I that's what beat. the NIT, that's what NIT oh, says. Oh, okay. But I'm telling you, the NIV says I beat my body. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the 2010 edition of the NIV says I strike a blow to my body. Don't, 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 I buffet don't my body. Don't think I'm going to be de defending uh, the NIV. Okay. It's I, the best-selling translation in America in 2013. I, I doubt that. I looked it up in many sources. I think the it ESV, is number one. I, I, well, okay. ESV, if you include, if you include, ESV is number five, and I did a lot of research. Okay. On this. If you if you include liberal denominations maybe so first corinthians 9 27 you're not going to defend the niv's beating yourself no because it's it's catholic i mean the catholic church oh don't good night that's not where it came well, hold from. on a second Come are on. you going to say that catholics don't beat themselves to this day they don't I'm, practice self-flagellation <laughs> are you going to say that henry the eighth some few do the vast majority don't even show up at mass okay, they're not going to be whipping about themselves throughout history okay what about in england there, when there henry the eighth kicked out the catholics but and Stephen, he made beating yourself illegal the but same Stephen, year. But Stephen, what does that have to do with the NIV translators? 
You see, just because, 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 just this because is what Rome, to, just because devil, Rome has done it in the past doesn't mean that that's what they intended by it. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that Satan is Satan, okay? And the same Satan that got people to beat themselves in the Middle Ages is the same Satan that put a passage in the NIV you know, telling you to beat yourself. You know, that's what I'm, that's where I'm know, drawing the connection. You know, uh, you know, even with the rendering of the NIV, mm -hmm. it's obvious what it's talking about, and it's obviously metaphorical. Okay. Okay, the amplified version. I don't know about you, but the amplified version was always too loud for me. You know, that's I never really even got. But anyway, listen to the amplified version. But like a boxer, I buffet my body. Now, let me ask this. Have you ever known a boxer who beats himself up? Because I haven't. The common English Bible really, really makes it easy to understand for you. Because isn't that why you like these new versions? Because they're easy to understand. Rather, I'm landing punches on my own body and subduing it like a slave. Look, beating yourself is not a biblical doctrine. And you say, well, he's just meaning it figuratively. Well, what about all these people who actually beat themselves? It's a strange doctrine, my friend. I don't believe in it. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 7, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So the Bible's teaching us here not to just vainly repeat things over and over again, thinking that if we say something over and over again, God's going to hear us more than if we just said it once. What's a repetition? Saying the same thing twice or three times or five times. He's saying, look, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Okay, the NIV, on the other hand, and all the modern versions pretty much change this. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Babel is when you're just talking about meaningless things and going on and on and on, just blathering. It's not the same as vain repetitions. If I said to a Roman Catholic, you know, you're repeating the same prayer of the Our Father over and over and over and over. You're not going to be heard for your much speaking. That's a vain repetition. You need to say that one time and be done with it and not just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. You know... That's supported by Matthew 6, 7. But if I say to them, hey, stop babbling like a pagan, they're going to say, well, this isn't babble. Right. They're going to say the Lord's Prayer is God's Word. Because yep. it is God's Word, right? But I'm not going to chant that or repeat that in a vain way to God. But the Catholic Church teaches vain repetitions, so that alteration has been made. Not only that, but the Catholics have a very strong doctrine of confessing your sins to the priest. And they'll take you to James 5.15. And in the Catholic Bible, there's a note in the column that says, hey, this verse is telling you to confess your sins to the priest. It says that, for example, in the Douay Reims Catholic Bible, in the notes, that's what it says. James 5.16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now listen to what the NIV and the modern versions change this to. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That's the NIV. Now you say, well, that's the same thing, but it's not the same thing. First of all, if you go back to the original language, if you go back to what it actually says in the Greek, the word is fault, it's not sin. In the Textus Receptus, mm -hmm. it uses the word for faults, paroptomata, okay. which comes from paroptoma, which means faults. And I think sometimes people, when they read the wrong thing there, that they're too busy confessing their sins to men rather than their sins to the God. Because right. if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins right. and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Whereas I confess my faults to you when I might say, I'm weak in this one area of my life. I need to be strengthened. Will you pray for me? So when I confess my fault to you, I'm not going to confession, nor am I confessing my sin to you, mm -hmm. but I'm confessing the faults and weaknesses that I have personally. So there is a difference in the understanding of the words between sin and faults themselves. Right. Evangelical Christianity historically has not accepted Catholicism as being true Christianity. It used to be when I was a child that the Christian bookstore would have books and literature exposing the Catholic Church, warning you about the Catholic Church. Now you go to a Christian bookstore and they have rosary beads, they sell Catholic Bibles, they sell Catholic paraphernalia. What we're seeing is a blurring of the lines between evangelical Christianity and Roman Catholicism. People are being prepared for a one world religion that unites 
Catholicism, all denominations of Christianity, in fact, all religions of the world. Those who push for a global religious organization believe that all religions, while different on the surface, are each valid pathways to God. Instead of all these different gods, maybe there's one God who manifests himself and revealed himself in different ways to different people. You know, what about that, huh? Do we all worship the same God, Christian and Muslim? I think we do. Does. We have different routes of getting to the Almighty. Do Christians and non-Christians, do Muslims go to heaven in your mind? Yes, they do. We have different routes of getting there. I think everybody that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people out of the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. They are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. Until I die, I'll proclaim nothing but love for all my brothers and sisters in Christ, my Catholic brothers and sisters, Protestant brothers and sisters, Christian reformers, Lutherans, I don't care what label you are. And you know, Jack, there are so many other Protestant ministers who are doing the same yes. thing as you. Yes. You're comfortable with the Vatican? Oh, I'm very comfortable with the Vatican. I've been to see the Pope several times. They believe in Christ. They believe in the death of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. I feel that I belong to all the churches. I'm equally at home in an Anglican or Baptist church or Brethren Assembly or Roman Catholic church. You know what, we don't all have the same views and I realize Mormonism is not traditional Christianity, but. I'm probably a little broader and more open in the fact that when somebody loves Jesus and believes they're the Son of God, that's good for me. Robert McGinnis with the Family Research Council says it appears the hidden agenda is to unite people under one religious organization so they will peacefully accept UN goals such as population control, abortion rights, and one world government. They are all coming together as one under the authority of Lucifer. The devil knows that in order to get people to accept the new world order, to accept false religion, he has to make changes very slowly. He's not going to jerk the steering wheel. The devil is slowly chipping away at the foundations of our religion. The devil is slowly chipping away at the foundation of the word of God. He's slowly chipping away at true biblical Christianity so that he can replace it with a new global religion where the Antichrist will be worshipped as the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe that modern Bible versions are going to play a role in that new world order? Well, I think it's very possible because the, the more translations that come out, the more liberal they seem to become mm -hmm. and more acceptable to the general population. But there's over 200 now, 200 plus. Right. And in these translations now, we have people throwing in translations for for those who are gay and lesbian, mm -hmm. we have people throwing in translations that are removing he or she, making it it. So I think in the modern translations and the ones that are coming out that are becoming more and more liberal, mm -hmm. allows all faiths of all different types of people and beliefs to come together and not be offended by any particular thing. That's ecumenical in nature. Right. So ecumenism is part and parcel mm -hmm. with the end time. Right. The King James Bible uses the word hell 54 times. I mean, when you read the Old Testament in the NIV, there's not even one mention of the word hell. You don't even read the word hell in the NIV until you get to the book of Matthew. Now, supposedly, these new versions are being written so that they'll be easier to understand. And yet, if we were to ask anybody on the street what hell is, they would be able to tell us that hell is a place of fire and torment. It's a place where people go after they die to be punished and to suffer. If we ask them what Sheol means, most people aren't going to know. What does the word Sheol mean? Sheol? Sheol means a, a, a protective cover. Say it again. Sheol. Say it again. What, spell it out. S-H-E-O. I'm not sure on that. No. Okay. No. No. No, I do not. No. No. Uh, no. I don't know. S what? 
S H E O L, Sheol. No. Oh, Sheol, no. Not. Can't remember off the top of my head. S H E O L. Right. I'm not sure. I've never seen that okay. word. No, I'm not so familiar with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Most people aren't familiar with that word. Do you do you think that those words are easier than the word hell? No. Okay. I believe that the King James Bible is the word of God. I believe that it's without error, and I believe that the other versions that are coming out, you know, the NIV, the New American Standard, that they're bad, that they're of the devil. In your book, it seems that you don't see at all that there could be anything nefarious behind any of these changes. You seem to not believe that the devil would ever tamper with his word or that any of these changes were nefarious, that, that any of the textual variances have to do with a guy who says, I'm gonna change this because I'm evil. Yeah, I, 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 actually believe, God's I, word. I actually believe God is, has, has protected his word. But you don't believe that there's a, and for example, you use the term conspiracy theorist probably 20 times in your book. Do you believe that there's no conspiracy to change God's word? No, I, I think I think entire Bible translations exist today to change God's but word. But could they have but existed obvious, back they're then clear. also? If there are people today no. who are putting out something like the New World Translation, if, which is clearly a perversion of God's uh -huh, word, do you agree? Uh -huh, yep. Okay. So if people are perverting God's word today with the New World Translation, for example, they were perverting God's word in Paul's day. He warned about it. Mm -hmm. Why do you not believe that people were perverting God's word in the 3rd, 4th century, 8th century, ninth century? We know that the New World Translation is a perversion of God's word. Mm -hmm. It is easy to detect. There has to, the reason I used conspiracy theory is mm -hmm. that you have to have evidence to back these things up, not just, well, it looks like that to me. Mm -hmm. You know the only places where the New World Translation mistranslates stuff is that the very issues with Watchtower Bible and Tract Society happens to disagree with biblical you may, Christianity. You must not have read Job 6, verse 6 in the New World Translation. Why? Then. Because in Job 6, 6, in the King James Bible, it says, Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? And is there any taste in the white of an egg? And in the New World Translation, it says, Is there any taste in the slimy juice of the marshmallow? So, <laughs> so that's something that they changed that has nothing to do with the Watchtower, all right? So... What I'm well, saying that what I, I'm saying there is that you, you know, memorized that. Could there be? You, you yes, memorized I memorized that. Could, I didn't even know marshmallow had slimy juice. I mean, if you have a new world translation, I I'd be I glad to show well, you. But you, you believe me. Oh, but did you know something? There's a new edition just came out last week. I bet it still says marshmallow, but I'll check. I will. But have anyway, to look. but here's here's my point with that though. <laughs> what about what about all the people out there? And you've heard this a million times. I've heard it a million times. That tell you, oh, the Bible's filled with contradictions. So couldn't, all there, the time. couldn't there be an agenda to create contradictions just to make or, or just to put they stupid they things in the Bible, no, just to put things in the no, Bible that sound no, stupid like no. Saul was. What about this? Saul was one year old Look, when he began to reign. First Samuel 13, one in the King James Version says Saul reigned one year and when he had reigned two years over Israel in the English Standard Version, that's changed to Saul lived for one year and then became king. 1 Samuel 13, 1 in the Douay Reims version, which is the Catholic Bible. Saul was a child of one year when he began to reign, and he reigned two years over Israel. You know what that verse just told us? That Saul was a one-year-old when he became a king. Here's the problem. 1 Samuel 9, 2 says, from his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any other people. Well, according to the English Standard Version, he was one year old when he was head and shoulders above all the men. I was one big baby. I'm just trying to tell you these Bibles are dumb. Sometimes I'm out soul winning and people will say to me, I don't believe the Bible because there's mistakes in the Bible. And I'll say, show me one. And they'll pull out an NIV. I'll say, don't show me. I could show you mistakes in that thing. I could show you contradictions in that thing. Show me one in the King James Bible. You won't find one. Here's another change that the modern versions make. Galatians chapter 5. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. The NIV says, as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. <laughs> now, does that sound like something that the Bible would teach that the Apostle Paul would say? A and you say, well, I don't think that's what they meant in the NIV. Well, is that why the common English Bible translated it? I wish that the ones who are upsetting you would castrate themselves. 
Or how about the contemporary English version, the CEV? I've seen this one on sale at the Christian bookstore. I wish that everyone who is upsetting you would not only get circumcised, but would cut off much more. I mean, are you listening to this? Because this term cut off has nothing to do with being emasculated or castrated or mutilating yourself. Paul is referring back to these Old Testament scriptures about people who disobey God's word that they would be cut off. Look, I don't have time to show you all the hundred and some examples of this. All he's saying there is that they need to be kicked out. He wished that they'd be cut off. He wished that they would be destroyed by God. That's what cut off means. They're going to be either destroyed by God or cut off can mean that they need to be kicked out of the congregation, kicked out of the assembly, kicked out of the nation of Israel. That's the term cut off. But, but these weirdos with their modern versions are having the Apostle Paul uh, saying, man, I wish those guys would just emasculate themselves. I wish they'd all castrate themselves. I wish they'd all mutilate themselves. I mean, that is not what he was teaching at all. Very strange indeed. But not only do these new versions contain a lot of crazy things that make the Bible look foolish, they also have a very specific agenda to prepare people for the new world order. And part of that preparation is to convince Christians to obey the government no matter what. The key passage that they've tampered with is Romans 13. I'm free to make myself a slave. I'm free to give up some of my freedom. I'm free, but I'm free to submit to the authority of my government. Even bad governments do God's work by keeping even a semblance of order in the streets. Even the government of the Soviet Union under Stalin was doing work for God. Even China under Mao Zedong was doing work for God. Honor the king. Do it anyway, whether the king deserves it or not. Honor your governor. Honor your mayor, whether or not they deserve it. Honor the king. No one will be able to be armed. We will take all weapons. Today in New Orleans, they got a lot tougher on the holdouts. Police department, if you're home! Not only the flooded areas, but New Orleans' driest and wealthiest neighborhoods, too. But gun confiscation is exactly what happened during the state of emergency following Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. U.S. troops also arrived. Easing public fears and quelling dissent would be critical. And that's exactly what the clergy response team, as it's called, helped accomplish in New Orleans. The primary thing that we say to anybody is let's cooperate and get this thing over with, and then we'll settle the differences once the crisis is over. Such clergy response teams would walk a tightrope between the needs of the government versus the wishes of the public. For the clergy, one of the biggest tools that they will have in helping calm the public down or obey the law is the Bible itself, specifically Romans, Romans 13. Because the government is established by the Lord. And that's what we believe in the Christian faith. That's what's stated in the scripture. But wait a minute. What if a police officer just comes to my house and says, wash my car, slave? Does the Bible require me to obey that? No. Okay, what if a police officer asked me to do something illegal? I mean, what if a policeman came to me and said, you know what, I want you to climb over the fence into your neighbor's house and I want you to look through the window and see what your neighbor's doing. I want you to spy on your neighbor for me. I mean, do I have to obey that? Or what if the, you say, you're picking stupid examples. Right, because there's never been a government anywhere that commanded people to spy on their neighbors or else. That's never happened, right? There's no such thing as Nazi Germany. There's no such thing as the Soviet Union. Just shut up and obey what you're told. Romans 13 is a passage that explains to us the purpose of government is to punish evildoers. Not to regulate every aspect of our lives and tell us what to do and control us. But also a key thing that is taught in Romans 13 is that we are to obey the higher powers. So for example, in the United States, we have various levels of government, don't we? Now, what is the supreme law of our land? Well, first of all, it's God's law. First, we obey God. After that is the Constitution of the United States because the Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land. Say, well, the Bible says to honor the king, therefore we need to obey Obama. Well, hold on a second. Is Obama the king? Is our government run as a monarchy? And I thought that we have elected officials that answer to the people and that they are not above the law and that the supreme law of the land is the U.S. Constitution. So if we're going to obey the government that has been set up over us, if we're to obey the law of the land, that means we're supposed to obey the Constitution. The NIV just completely eliminates that teaching. It doesn't teach you to go with the higher power. It just says this. 
everyone must submit to governing authorities. So instead of saying, you know, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, there's no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God, just referring to the fact that no one on this earth has any legitimate authority except coming from God. Why do children have to obey their parents? Because God said so. Why do we obey human government at all? Why do we even have any respect for human government? Because God told us that human government is something that we need to punish evildoers, to protect the innocent from those that would harm them. Here's the New Living Translation in Romans 13.1. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. Watch this. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Now that is not true. The New Living Translation is saying that everyone in any position of authority has been placed there by God. That is not true. Because one day, the Antichrist is going to be placed in authority by Satan. The dragon gave him his authority, it says in Revelation 13. And not only that, but in Hosea, it says they've set up kings, but not by me. There are times when human authority has been placed there by man against the will of God. And so therefore the New Living Translation is saying in verse 6, pay your taxes too for the same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They're serving God in what they do. Give to them what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. Good night. Now it's not just the tax, it's also the fees. And those are the worst. The King James is telling you to obey government within a certain scope, within certain parameters of what their job is, what they're supposed to be doing, and also the whole concept of higher powers is there as a check and balance. Why isn't the New King James inspired? Because it uses the same manuscripts. Well, it, it doesn't. And there are many places where the New King James departs from the Texas Receptus and departs from what the King James is saying. Not in the New Testament. It, it does, actually. Yeah, there, there are actually a lot of places where it departs from the, from the TR. The New King James is probably one of the most dangerous versions out there because it leads you to think, oh, it's the same as the King James. It's just more modern, updated words. If that's all it was, I wouldn't even bring it up. Because a lot of people who wouldn't touch the NIV with a 10-foot pole, they wouldn't touch the ESV or the New Living Translation with a 10-foot pole, but they say, come on, Pastor Anderson, the New King James it's pretty much the same as the King James. It just gets rid of the these and the thou. It's just like the King James, except a little easier to understand. Okay, well, let me give you some, some stats on the New King James. The New King James omits the word Lord 66 times. It removes the word God 51 times. It removes the word heaven 50 times. It removes the word repent 44 times. The blood is removed 23 times. The word hell is removed 22 times, and he completely removes the word Jehovah, completely removes the word damnation, completely removes the term New Testament, completely removes the word devils. The Bible's not obsolete. You just need to get some smarts. You need to do some studying. You need to learn the language. And it's funny how my little children can understand it. And you're an adult and you can't understand it? And isn't it funny how the same people that say the King James is too hard to understand tell you you need to learn Greek if you really want to know what the Bible says? Yeah, that's really going to be easy to understand. The King James is too hard for you. Here's a Greek New Testament. These people are nuts. So let's check out some verses and see which one's easier to understand. The King James used a really hard word about a kind of tree, an oak. So the New King James thought, wow, that's way too hard. Oak, are you serious? They changed it to terebinth tree. That's a little easier to understand, right? Now, Judges 8.13 contains a really tough phrase in the King James. The sun was up. Okay, I mean, that, that almost could be in Hop on Pop. <laughs> the sun was up. They changed that to the ascent of Heres. The ascent of Heres. 1 Samuel 13.21, the King James used a really tough word, file. So the New King James changed that to PIM, P-I-M, PIM. I mean, that's probably good to know for Scrabble, but I've never heard of that word. <laughs> okay. 1 Samuel 22, 6 uses this really hard word, tree. So the New King James decided to update that to tamarisk tree to make it a little bit easier to understand. 2 Samuel 6, 5, the King James says cornet. Who knows what a cornet is? It's a type of horn, right? It's a type of trumpet. 
So they decided to use an easier word, systrums. Systrums, because everybody knows what systrums mean. Who knows what systrums means? Who knows what cornet means? There you go. Uh, Isaiah 13, 12 used the difficult word man in your King James Bible. I mean, good night. Put the King James in a museum where it belongs. Man? Give me something I can understand. Mortal is way better, right? Daniel 6, 2 used a really tough word, princes. So they used the easy word in the New King James, satraps. Banned? Banned in the King James. That's way too hard. Let's change it to regiment. Okay, and nobody's going to understand what quicksand means. That's so obsolete. Quicksands in Acts 27, 17. Sirtis sands is a lot easier to understand. You better get a new King James. Much easier to understand. Is the new King James really that much easier to understand than the King James? I mean, that was a lot of examples where the King James is a lot easier. And that wasn't a complete list. That was just a bunch of examples. So it really has nothing to do with making it easier to understand. It just has to do with changing it, corrupting it, twisting it, perverting it. The only thing that they can really point to and say, well, this is where we made it a lot easier, is getting rid of the these and the thous. But you got to have the these and the thous. Because the these and the thous are singular, and the you, ye, your is plural. The ones that start with a TH are singular. The ones that start with a Y are plural. It affects the meaning. Because you often would have no way of knowing whether he's talking to one person or the whole group. Unless you had the these and the thous there to tell you that. It's important. It's all important. But let me just show you some doctrinal changes that the New King James make that pervert doctrine. Go to 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Brother Garrett, read that for me nice and loud in the New King James. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So notice, in the King James, it said that we are saved. In the New King James, it said we're being saved. Big difference, because salvation is not a process. Salvation happens in a moment of time, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We believe on Christ, and we are passed from death to life. It's not a process. I'm not being saved. I done been saved. Amen. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says this, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. Read it for me from the New King James. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Again, not that are saved, but those who are being saved as if it's a process. Matthew 7, 14, for example, in the New King James says, Difficult is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The King James says narrow, referring to how many people are going, referring to the fact that there are few that be saved. The New King James says it's difficult. Now, if it were by works, it would be difficult. New Living Translation says, But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. The English Standard Version says, For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard. And that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And you say, well, Pastor Manus, what's the big deal? Straight, narrow, narrow, difficult, difficult, hard. What's the big deal? Here's the big deal. Is it hard to get saved? Hey, Jesus did the hard part. How hard is it to accept a gift? How hard is it to take a drink of water? How hard is it to walk through a door? How hard is it to eat a piece of bread? These are the things that Jesus compared salvation to because it's easy to be saved because you don't have to work your way to heaven. You know what salvation is referred to in the Bible as in the book of Hebrews? Rest. Look, is rest hard? Don't be deceived by these modern versions. You might be tempted one day, ah, oh, you know, this church uses the New King James, but so what? It's a big deal. Amen. Do you think that we need 500 different English Bibles? No, in fact, I, I mentioned uh, we have a glut. We don't have any need for any anymore. I don't think there's a good reason for why we've had the explosion of them over the past number of decades. I know what the reason is. 
Right. It's real simple. It's, it's, it's the fact that if you have a publishing house and you want to do a study Bible or something, which I am not a study Bible fan. Me neither. What they did is if you were a major publishing house, you didn't want to have to pay royalties to somebody else. So they all made their own translations. Right. There is a financial motivation to come out with all these different versions. There is. No mm -hmm. question about it. Right. No question about it. Um, does God expect the average Christian to learn the God original Greek? God expects the average Christian to utilize the information that is provided to him. And we live in a day where we have more information available to us than any other generation ever has. And we need it right now because the mm. attacks have never been more right. vociferous. Do you see a danger? Okay, because here, here's my belief about it. I think if someone learned Koine Greek and became fluent in it and mm -hmm. could pick it up and read it fluently, mm -hmm. that would be fantastic. But... A little Greek is a dangerous thing. Exactly. <laughs> Don't you see a danger yes. in someone yes. who learns two semesters of oh. Bible college Greek, and now they're going to get up and say, like even a King James only guy oh, sure. will get up. He's had two semesters of Bible college Greek, and he's going to get Stephen. up and say, oh, the, the King James translators, they translated this wrong. And just with the brush of his hand, you know, seven Stephen. years of 50 brilliant scholars yeah. goes out the yeah. window for his... Stephen, any good thing can be abused. Oh. And a little Greek can be a dangerous thing. I've heard entire sermons based upon really bad exegesis, okay? But let me just mention that years ago, I had a minister come to me and he said, hey, I, I, I saw this thing in the commentary. Man, this preaches. But I've never heard anybody say it before. Could, you know Greek. Could you check it out for me? Mm -hmm. So I checked it out for him. It didn't, it didn't pan out. Right. It was just one of those, you know, commentators sort of went off on a tangent. Sure. You know what he did once I told him? He preached it anyways. Just because it's because it just it. preached oh, it's so such a great good. Point, oh, it's so great. <laughs> that doesn't surprise uh, me. No, all. unfortunately, okay, it doesn't surprise so me. So no one disagrees that the originals were inspired. The Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But they don't believe what we have today is inspired because they don't believe in the preservation of the Bible. But you know, the Bible says in Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And you know, the same God that brought us the inspired word is the same God that's going to preserve the inspired word. And I think it's silly to think that God is powerful enough to use sinful men and make sure he gives us a perfect original. And then that same God can't use sinful men and make sure it's preserved from this generation forever. I believe God is powerful enough to give us an inspired word, and I believe God is powerful enough to preserve those same inspired words from this generation forever. Now let me ask you this, do you believe that people need to learn the Hebrew or Greek or even English, or should they, can they have the Bible in all languages? They should have the Bible in all languages. Okay. This is why we support translation ministries like Bibles International. The Textus Receptus is used, and the Hebrew Bible mm -hmm. is also used, obviously, to translate into other languages, right. which would be the Word of God. We believe that every people should have the Bible in their language. And in English, it's the King James Bible. Let me just close by saying this. God's word has been preserved unto us in this generation. Listen to Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee and my words, which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. He said, look, Isaiah, the word that you're preaching, your descendants will preach it. Your children and their children and their children from henceforth and forever will have these words. And I believe that those are the words that are in my hand right now. Amen. And look, the modern versions, whether it be the NIV, the ESV, the New Living Translation, or the New King James, that philosophy is a philosophy that says God's word is not preserved. We had to go dig up a new one. We had to go dig up an older manuscript to fix all the problems in it. No, I believe that it's been preserved from the time of Christ until now. 
It's been passed down, and what we have today is a copy of a copy of a copy that has been passed down. A lot of people wrongly believe that the King James Bible has changed over the years, that the 1769 edition that we use today is completely different from the 1611. But in reality, the only thing that changed in 1769 were spellings, capitalizations, punctuation, some typos that were corrected. The words did not change. The words that we have today in our King James Bible are the exact same words that were given us by the translators in 1611. The words haven't changed. The words have been preserved, and that's what God promised that he would preserve. He says, look, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words should not pass away. He didn't say the thoughts. He didn't say the ideas. He didn't say the doctrine. He said, my words shall not pass away. These new versions are from a corrupt source, and they have corrupt fruit. Look at the fruit of these new versions. Look at the way churches have become fun centers. Look at the way churches have become as a result of these new modern versions, filled with unsaved people, filled with people who don't know doctrine, don't care about doctrine. Because when you're reading a book that's filled with contradictions, it's hard to care about doctrine. But when you're reading a book that is perfect and pure and preserved, you know, you look at every word and you care about doctrine and you care about what it says and you care about what it means. Not just, well, yeah, I kind of got the gist of it. Jesus died on the cross. I get it. No, I want to know specifically every doctrine that God has for me Amen. from the word of God. You know, to touch this book and to study it is one thing. To appreciate it from a distance about what men, women, children had to go through so that you and I could read a book today called a Bible without fear of persecution. It's easy to say this number. 10,000 people were burned, stoned, deboweled for reading this book. I study really early in the morning or sometimes late into the evening. So I might wake up at three with an idea mm -hmm. and I go and I study that in the scripture. And you realize the beauty of it and what it's conveying. And you just sit there with tears running down your cheek because you recognize the greatness of what you've been given. So when I study the King James Bible, I'm completely confident mm -hmm. that what I have in my hand is the Word of God from cover to cover. Mm -hmm. And that it's the same now as it will be in an hour from now. Mm -hmm. It's because it's preserved and it's the same. Mm -hmm. So I have confidence when I open it up and preach from it on Sunday and teach from it in Sunday school or witness to people on the street. I know that this is the Word of God and we look forward to meeting the very Word Himself mm -hmm. in glory to testify to what we've been studying our whole life. God is not pleased with these men removing verses, adding verses, adding things, removing things. Go to Revelation, Revelation 22, 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. You ever read the book of Revelation? There's a lot of nasty plagues in that book. He said, I'm going to give you those plagues if you add to my word. Revelation 22, 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which were written in this book. But these men that have changed the word of God, the Bible says they lost their opportunity to be saved. He said, I will take away. He said, in the same way you took away from my word, I will take away his part out of the book of life. He said, I will make sure you are not saved because you have messed with my Bible. That sounds to me like God is pretty serious about this. Say, okay, Pastor Jimenez, I, I agree. I understand. These Bibles are corrupt. They're corrupting doctrine. The King James Bible is pure. The King James Bible is the word of God. I understand. What do I do with it? If you realize that you have God's Word in your hand. Not the thoughts of God, not what He might have said, not what He, what He think He said, but the actual words of God. And not just that, but when you have the words of God, you actually have God. Not this book, but these words. When you realize that you have God's words, man, that should drive us to read the Bible. That should drive us to live by this Bible. This book has every answer for every question in life. 
You say, Pastor Menas, I came to Verity Baptist Church. I didn't really come here to learn about the King James Bible. I came here to learn about salvation. We learn about salvation in the King James Bible. I didn't really come here to learn about this issue. I came here so that I can get help with my marriage. This book will help your marriage. I didn't really come here to learn about the King James Bible. I came here to learn about how to raise my kids. This book will help you raise your kids. It'll solve all your problems. It'll bring you salvation. It'll do everything you need it to do. Why? Because it's the Word of God. Without error, perfect. Exactly like God gave it to you. It gives me confidence to realize that the Word of God is perfect. You know why so many people are not believing in God today? not coming to church. Generations of young people are just living churches by the droves, never coming back. Because these modern Bible versions have been corrupted, there's mistakes in them, and it's caused them to doubt their faith in God. But not this one. This one's perfect. The King James Version is the Word of God. Read it, learn it, study it, memorize it, live by it, preach it to others. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you have not made us responsible to preserve your word. But that is a responsibility that you've given to yourself. You inspired it. You preserved it. And you have given it to us today. Father, we love you. Help us not to leave here today and just let this message go in one ear and out the other. Help us to realize, I have the Word of God, maybe I should read it. Maybe I should study it. Maybe I should live it. We love you, Lord. In your precious name I pray. Amen.
I'd like to ask you a question. Do you know for sure if you died today, would you go to heaven? You may say, I'm not sure if I'm going to heaven. Maybe you've never even thought of it. But the Bible says you could be 100% sure you are on your way to heaven. Now, according to the Bible, you need to understand a few things in order to be able to receive salvation. The first thing is this. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that sin is the transgression of the law. When we break God's law, we sin. And according to that verse, we've all sinned. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. And unfortunately, there, is a, there are wages for our sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Now, the word wages means payment. It's what you earn. When I go to work, they give me money. Those are my wages. But because of my sin, the wages is death. What I earn is death. For the wages of sin is death. Now, when we think of death, most people think of a physical death. But Revelation chapter number 20, verse 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, a reference to hell. It says, This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So according to the Bible, our wages for our sin is not just a physical death, but the second death. You say, what is the second death? Being cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. What we earn because of our sin is death, a physical death, the second death, which is being cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8 says, For the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters. Now that's a pretty bad list, right? Murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers. Most people would agree. A murderer, oh yeah, they're going to go to hell. But notice he says, For the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters. And at the end of that list, he says this, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And the reason that God adds that sin of lying at the end of that list, he's trying to make a point. And the point is this, we're all sinners. Every human being has lied. And he's trying to say, there is none righteous. We've all sinned. We all deserve to go to hell. Now that's the bad news. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, and, and we're all initially condemned to hell. But the gospel is the good tidings or the good news. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. We understand what that means now. But the second part of that verse says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says that God has a gift He wants to give you, and that gift is eternal life. Now in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. The word grace means to get something you don't deserve. You didn't earn it. You didn't pay for it. Are ye saved is a reference to being saved from hell, because I don't want to go there. I'm sure you don't want to go there. Through faith, means the word faith means to believe. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. has nothing to do with you. Here's why. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. A gift is not something you work for. A gift is something that's given to you. Someone else pays for it, but you don't pay for it. If I gave you a gift and asked you to give me money for it, that wouldn't be a gift. If I gave you a gift but asked you to do something for it, that wouldn't be a gift. Now, the gift doesn't cost you anything, but it costs the person giving it to you something. And the gift of God is the exact same way. Jesus had to pay for that gift. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The gospel is this. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He never sinned, never did anything wrong. He died on the cross, was buried. The Bible tells us his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights, and he rose from the grave, not to pay for his own sin because he had no sin. He died to pay for our sins. And see, it's already been paid for. The gift has already been paid for. Now, you've got to understand this about the gift. John 3.16 says everlasting life. The gift is everlasting life. That means, the word everlasting means it'll last forever. Life that'll last forever. It's never going to end. John 3.15 says eternal life. Eternal means it'll never end. Uh, John 3.36 says everlasting life. Romans 6.23 says eternal life. All throughout the Bible, you find this concept. Eternal life. Everlasting life. Life that will last forever. Life that will never end. According to John 3.36, you get it the moment you believe. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Now, some people think, well, 
I can receive salvation, but once I have it, if I do something really bad, like commit adultery, like murder, commit suicide, then God is going to take away my salvation. But if he takes it away, then it didn't last forever. See, we got to understand that salvation is not something that we earn. And once we have it, it's not something that we keep. The Bible says in Titus 1, 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. See, our hope for eternal life is this, God can't lie. If God promised me eternal life, then guess what? It's eternal life. If He promised me everlasting life, then it's going to last forever. You say, well, what if I do something really bad? Well, it's not of ourselves. It has nothing to do with me. It's a gift that will last forever. Now, here's the only thing you need to do. Just like any other gift, you get a choice, whether you'd like to accept it or reject it. You may ask, well, how do I accept the gift of God? Romans 10, 9 says this, that if. Now, it says if because you get a choice. He says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. The word confess means to admit. You say, what am I admitting? Well, you're admitting you're a sinner. You're admitting that you deserve to go to hell. But you're asking for forgiveness. He says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. But it's more than just saying words. He also says, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. You're believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the grave as a payment for your sins. He says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It doesn't say you hopefully will be saved. God says, I will save you if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Notice you don't have to go to church. It doesn't say you have to get baptized. It doesn't say you have to repent of your sins. It doesn't say you have to do anything. Simply believe and ask Him to save you. If you believe that in your heart, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, rose from the grave, He wants to give you a gift, it's eternal life, then why don't you just confess with your mouth right now? I'd like to help you form a prayer. If you believe that, why don't you just pray with me right now? Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I deserve to go to hell. Please forgive me of all my sin and give me eternal life. I'm not trusting in my works. I'm not trusting in my religion. I'm only trusting in you. Thank you for saving me. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you believed in your heart, according to the Bible, you're now saved. You have eternal life. Congratulations.